but Matt and Ann also do a podcast together called Preventing Grace, which is from the prayer book, and preventing then in the old-fashioned language means to go ahead of you, to prevenient grace. It is something that, um, it is not preventing grace, but uh, you have to explain that every time you tell the, uh, the, the name of the podcast. Ann is the author of a book that will be for sale in the back. It is a daily devotional, um, 365 entries, uh, called Nailed It, and it's a wonderful daily devotional, and it, you'll see it's in... in, in uh, echoes and mirrors her, her own style, her unique, witty, you know, style. And um, also, there is an year-long Bible reading plan, so it's not too late to get one, and then you can start January 1st, and this time next year, you'll be almost through the entire Bible if you stick to the plan. Um, as you can read in your, I don't have your bio in front of me, but Anne is a graduate, not of Columbia, but of Cornell. I was wrong about that. I was corrected. Um, she is an author, she's a speaker, she has a uh, sub-stack, which some of you may not know what that is, but I'm going to put a link into the easing so you can click on it, and it's just simply a fancy new way of saying blog, right? I mean, that's essentially what it is. But I highly, highly recommend you all um, clicking on that link when you get it and signing up for her daily, almost daily, uh, writings and musings and sort of theological reflections, and you'll see, you'll get a taste of what she offers every day here uh, at this speaking series, but it is a delight and a joy and a wonderful encouragement every day, every single day I read it, so I'm tear up thinking about it. But anyway, it is a wonderful joy, a privilege, and honor to have Anne Kennedy with us. Please do. And his world that he invented was called the Disc World. 
Uh, it was a flat, it, well it is, because it's still out there in the fiction universe. Uh, it's a, a, a <coughs> flat disc hurtling through space on the back of four elephants on the back of a huge turtle named Artuin. And uh, in the disc world, on Hog's Watch Night, which bears a certain resemblance to our Christmas festivities, um, the hog father gets into his sleigh pulled by magical hogs and flies through the air to deliver presents to children. As the movie opens, um, the auditors, though, of, this, of the disc world, the auditors keep track of everything in the disc world. They get above themselves and they decide they really need more control over how people think and feel and what they do. And so, for whatever nefarious totalitarian reason, they decide it's time to get rid of the Hog Father. So, they go to the Assassin's Guild, because if you're going to have crime in the disc world, it might as well be organized. It works better that way. Uh, and they engage the services of a gentleman named Mr. He calls himself Mr. Teotomy, but it's really Tea Time, Mr. Tea Time, who has ominously given a lot of thought already to how to get rid of the Hog Father. It's a pretty dark movie, actually. <laughs> My children love it. Uh, <laughs> And the plot is really intricate, so I'm going to try to pare it down here. But basically, Death, who is a staple Pratchett character, who shows up in every novel, um, Death, uh, who always talks in all capital letters, uh, he sees that the, that the hourglass is running out on the Hogfather, and he decides to do something about it. So what do you do when the hog father is fading away? You get a false beard, you get a red hog father outfit, you take your assistant, death's assistant Albert, with you in your sleigh to deliver the presents to all those desolate stockings. Uh, quickly though, death becomes overwrought uh, by his task. and he, uh, mainly because he, he discovers for the first time how unfair the distribution of holiday goods and cheer turns out to be at Hog's Watch. Uh, it sends him essentially into an existential crisis, which is important. Um, Pratchett is really big on puns. So if you don't like a good pun, you should not read any Terry Pratchett, but I, I recommend them to you. So he, uh, he's tr he wants to give all the children of the disc world um, all that they desire. And Albert, his assistant, has to explain to him that based on so socioeconomic status, uh, the little boy in the dark, grimy hovel uh, will not be getting uh, everything that he asked for, but will in fact receive uh, a rudely carved wooden image and a rotting apple, uh, not a puppy. But so Jeff complains, all those children in the department store got everything they wanted. Why can't this little boy have a puppy? Well, to answer that question, Albert uh, goes on a long sort of imaginative description of himself, Albert, as a little boy, who once stood with his nose glued to a shop window, looking through at the most beautifully carved rocking horse you could ever imagine. And uh, so the scene cuts away so you can see little Albert there staring at the horse. And as you watch, a tall man walks into the shop and buys the horse. And you see this thought, like, maybe it's for me. But of course it's not. It's not. Albert does not get the horse. He's not in that class of people who can have that kind of horse. And he is so disappointed. Uh, you see uh, in this sort of hazy uh, cinematography, his eyes are red, his lips are 
heart quivering, he's filled with unconsummated desire. Yes, says the adult Albert, I would have killed for that horse. But you know what? I still hung up my stocking on Hog's Watch Eve. And do you know why? Because I had hope. And the next morning, our dad had put in my stocking a little wooden horse that he carved his very own self. That's what Albert says. Well, says Death, uh, that's, that was worth more than all the expensive toy horses in the world. Well, no, says the Albert, because you're a selfish little bugger when you're only seven, and only grown-ups think like that. Uh, death is alarmed and unhappy. Uh, it is unfair, he says. Well, that's life, said Albert. Uh, this is a terrible pun. But I'm not, says death. <laughs> and, uh, and this is supposed to be a season uh, to be jolly and other things ending in Ollie. So he stalks out of the hovel and he goes to get his granddaughter Susan, who has to make sure that the sun comes up and um, the auditors don't win. And um, I don't want to blow the plot because I'm sure you're going to want to watch it later. The wonderful thing about the wisdom of Albert, uh, would be Hogs Watch Pixie, is that he articulates so beautifully why, why the stretch between Christmas and Thanksgiving is so hard. Most of us, I would imagine, um, during most of the year, with the exception of maybe your birthday or some other kind of anniversary, manage to keep our uh, expectations um, at a low, uh, even check, if we have a good grip on ourselves. When it's a bright, sunny day, um, well, here it is, a bright, sunny day, um, but I live where this doesn't happen uh, very much. <laughs> and all you have to do is get through your work day and figure out what you're going to have for dinner, um, and then you're thwarted at every turn on that, that particular day, no matter what you do, everything goes wrong. You get cut off in traffic. Um, nobody will agree with you about anything. Uh, you fight with people. Everything goes wrong. It's unlikely on a day like that that you will suffer an existential meltdown just because you didn't get what you wanted that day. Uh, but Christmas, Christmas is about the essentials of what it means to be a person at all. Christmas is about getting to have beautiful things and eat beautiful food and not have to suffer psychic and physical uh, pain. It's about being surrounded by people you love and who love you. It's not, it's a time when the poor are not supposed to go hungry, uh, at least for a little time. Or if you're lonely and you live in a small town, um, there's just enough snowfall to make you look cute and not enough to make you put your back out when you have to shovel. Uh, Christmas is about not being disappointed. In some sense, uh, the deep need and desire to be okay, soul level, to be surrounded by love and acceptance, is manifested in Christmas. It's the engine that drives our economy. If we don't buy presents for each other, um, our country will go into the recession it's going to go into, but also we'll be sad. So too often, even though I know that I should not do this, so against my will, I relapse into hope at Christmas time. Sometimes even with the, with the intensity of a child, like a being clear-eyed and realistic about the true state of my late, my life and my relationships doesn't help me manage my Christmas malaise. And I'm pretty, I can't, I'm, I don't believe I'm alone. Um, you might play this mental game with yourself. Sure, the last six Christmases, your kids didn't come home when you wanted them to and they didn't come to church with you, um, but that's okay, maybe this year will be different. Or 
Sure, you can't press out the sadness every single day. This year I'm going to choose joy, choosing joy for Christmas. Um, sure, you have this ideal vision of what uh, Christmas tidings should be in your parties, in your house, and you didn't quite get to it this year, but this year it's going to be different because you're going to label your bins better this year. Um, something is going to be different this year. Realism, cool calculation, um, the only way to get through it uh, and keep that sublimated, I think, is a good amount of hallmark. Um, anyway, of course, the actual reason to celebrate Christmas, I'm sure you do know this, is Jesus. So let's talk about him for just a minute. One of the most exasperating things that Jesus ever did, you might remember this, was after dying and rising again, he went back up to heaven, leaving those who loved him best apparently on their own. You all remember this? His friends stood there on the mountain, their jaws open, looking up at the sky, wondering what on earth he could possibly be thinking. And a few days later, uh, you know, they all received the Holy Spirit and they were made into the church, which we're still a part today. Um, but the church and the Christian life, ever since that moment when he went up on that cloud, uh, has um, been in a difficult and a peculiar situation. In the most essential sense, we've been given everything that we're supposed to want, um, which is Jesus, obviously, and each other. So shouldn't we be completely satisfied? Shouldn't our lives be just a golden dream? Um, worse still, uh, looking, those looking in on the outside, who might walk by down the street, look in at the church, often think about us, what a bunch of fools. What are they doing? Week after week, day after day, working so hard to live a life that's ordered by a person they can't even see. And if their Jesus is so great, why are things so unfair? Why do those people still die? Why are so many of those Christians around the world so poor? Why do they argue with each other so much? Why are so many of them so sad? They should give up. Whatever they're doing, it's obviously pointless. If you look at a real Christian trying really hard to be good, be the sort of person he or she knows she should be. And then you looked at poor Albert with his nose glued to the window looking at his beautiful horse that he can't have. You might feel the same kind of thing. A little bit heartbroken for those people. This is sort of the argument, extremely tangentially, that the writer of Hebrews is working through. For the poor, disappointed Christians post-ascension who were dealing with the fact that their Lord and Savior left them. All around, people are telling them that they might as well give up. Many of them were terribly poor. Many were persecuted and lost everything. Many of them were cut off from the synagogue and rejected by their friends and family. They were discouraged beyond what you and I could possibly imagine. Sometimes I try just to get into the headspace. <laughs> this would be a good moment for them to have a real dose of reality, a good time to get a grip on their expectations, largely by lowering them down into the dirt where they belong. Instead, the writer of Hebrews says something that astonishes me every time of year when I go back to this text. He says, Hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering. He implores them, for he who promised is faithful. I actually said these words out loud to my wrecked Advent wreath um, on Sunday or whatever day it was that I flew here. Um, I love Advent so much, but I'm, a, I'm bad at Advent. So I always get my candles out after it started, and then I don't light them every week. And when my kids were little, I'd have those big calendars with chocolate, but I would buy them late, 
so they would have to catch up on their chocolate, and then we would miss a couple weeks, so then towards the end they were just like gorging on stale chocolate. Uh, and then for a while, I think on my blog, I told people that we did a beautiful Advent devotional. Every evening of Advent, we would sing together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and light the candles. And then I actually took stock of what we were actually doing, and I had to admit that that was actually a unicorn. We maybe did it one time, um, one, one year. <laughs> Advent is really... Um, like a, a pre a Christmas pre failure season. That's what Advent is. Um, so this year again, because I'm an idiot, I said this is going to be my year. I'm going to do Advent this year. So I got my candles before Advent. I made a beautiful wreath, um, and then I got sick. The first real illness I've had in five years. And you'll know, in the last five years, some big things have happened. None of those things happened to me. I finally got sick uh, after COVID. I spent three days in bed, and um, my children did not get sick. So I got up from my sick bed to come here, and um, my robust, healthy six children um, had disordered my household affairs entirely right before I had to get on the airplane. And so there I was with my suitcase, standing, looking at my advent wreath, of which two whole candles are actually broken apart. And I thought, this is the moment for me to give up forever. <laughs> but no, I said out loud, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Uh, because that hope is not a successful advent, advent observance. It's not even a jolly Christmas. It's something deeper and more unsettling than that. The whole book of Hebrews is a long exposition of how Jesus is a full, perfect, sufficient oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. The kind of sacrifice that God required to finally do away with the sins that you and I commit. Uh, because we don't just suffer from a feeling of futility, um, a low-grade sense of alienation and frustration. No, that feeling of futility is a proper reflection of reality. Um, it's okay, it's good to feel that. Because we can't accomplish our desires. We can't get what we want. We can't have the relationships we most long for in life. We can see what they are. We can name them for true. But we can't have them. They're elusive. And the worst part of it is that just when you think you might be getting close to having something that you really want and need, um, even actually maybe getting it, like grasping it for a minute, that's the moment you discover it's not enough. It's not actually the thing I wanted most. I'm not satisfied. It's not what I was hoping for. And there's a reason for that. The reason is so obvious that it escapes most of our attention. The reason is that we mistake our desire and need for God for all the things that come as a result of being in God's good pleasure. Uh, the congregation, hearing this letter of Hebrews read aloud to them, would have been in turmoil. Um, they wanted what they should want. They wanted Jesus. That's what you should want. Um, but they wanted the peace of quiet contentment, of not being killed, of not being poor and alienated from each other. Not wanting to suffer is a perfectly reasonable desire. Um, and therefore, um, they are disappointed because that perfectly reasonable desire is unmet. They are in trouble. And though they have Jesus, it doesn't feel sufficient. It doesn't feel like a perfect, sufficient sacrifice and oblation for the sins of the whole world, even though it is. Or to put it another way, if you got everything you wanted in this life, everything, would you be happy? The 
writer of Hebrews says, as an introduction to his hall of faith, which I assure, I assume you've all memorized this verse. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, not by faith, the people of the old, of old received the commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's a really complicated verse. To say it another way, what we can see has all been made by someone we can't see. And seeing this truth, that the invisible God created all of us here in this room, means that you are in the right kind of place, receiving a perfect commendation, uh, which is another way of saying nice things. You being made by God and seeing that he made you is a beautiful thing. Uh, you get to have nice things because you can see that. What sort of nice things? Well, the writer uh, zeroes in on Abraham, who I'm sure you remember, was looking for something. He was looking for a better country. A city, says the writer, that was designed and built carefully by God. But Abraham died not getting what he most wanted. Um, he was only allowed to greet those things that he wanted from afar, it says. It's an interesting line, which is like, I think, Albert staring through the window at the beautiful horse. He's looking for it from afar. He's so close and so far he can't, he can't get there. And the writer goes on to say, what more shall I say? He's listing things. I can't tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. Um, There's so many of them. Uh, and then he says these strange things. Um, these, these people uh, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, uh, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness. It's a beautiful chapter of beautiful things happening to people. It's so encouraging. Just don't read Judges um, or the Old Testament, because then you'll know how they really felt while that was going on. It's like a glorious thing, and they're all so depressed all the time. And then it, he brings it home. The writer uh, brings it home. Others, the beautiful things the others got were um, they suffered mocking and flogging in chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. That's probably Isaiah. They were killed with a sword. That's probably the prophet Zechariah. Uh, they went about in skins and sheep, uh, of sheep and goats. Elijah, maybe. They were destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. Jer Jeremiah fits the bill on that one. And then the writer says, they were those of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered around in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. With a friend like God, at the end of the chapter, you might want to say, who needs enemies? Why would he treat his prophets, his friends, his own people so poorly? Well, the writer gives a, a, a peculiar answer. All of these, he writes, commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had promised something better for, not them, us. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Um, when I was a child living far away in Africa, one Christmas, we took the bold step of inviting an entire family with lots and lots of children, like the Pokes have, um, <laughs> to our village um, for a whole week. And I, I'm an only child, and um, I rarely got to be with children my own age who also spoke English. It was a very, very special treat that was going to happen. Um, and you might, be, you might be able to imagine how antsy I was for weeks before Christmas. Um, the presence of these other children, whoever they were, was an absolute requirement, not only for the festivities to begin and be enjoyed, but also just for my peace of mind. I was so afraid they wouldn't come at all. Um, there was no calling or texting back then. Um, if something happened to them, we wouldn't be able to find out about it until it was too late. 
So for days, I lay in the mango tree overhanging the road, straining my eyes uh, to see any cloud of dust or hear any faint rumble of a car. And they did come. I had almost entirely given up hope. The roads were bad. They had had two flat tires. Um, they had had many tribulations along the way. The point, though, I think you will not be surprised to learn is that I can describe to you the waiting for those children, but I can say nothing to you about that actual Christmas. I can't remember at all what their names were, or how many of them there were, or if I got any presents, or if we had a good time. No idea. I often think of Abraham that way. He was given an impeccable promise that his son would become a great nation, that all the other nations in the world would be blessed through him. And then he was asked to wait, and then he died. When you read Genesis, you'll find the writer doesn't name Abraham's deep, unquenched longing the way that the writer of Hebrews does. For a city whose designer and builder is God. For a better country. You can imagine him there alone, looking out over the dusty horizon, longing for a full community, a full number of saints, a lot of children and friends to be gathered. That's what's encompassed in the words from us. He couldn't receive the promise apart from us. God was not willing to give his best and most perfect gift, Jesus, until such a time as we could also be made perfect. Which is to say that Abraham couldn't have what he most wanted uh, because it had to be the perfect time for God to solve the problem of our desires. He had to make us want him more than we wanted ourselves. And the only way he could do that was to die and rise again. It's the divine way of prying your nose off of the window pane and making you look at a real horse instead of the toy one. This is where the example of the hog father just completely breaks apart. And um, because the atonement of your sins is not about getting what you want in your stocking for Christmas, but bear with me. And also, I'm going to spoil the movie, but it's been out for a long time, so it's not my fault. So there's poor little Albert with his nose against the window pane, and so death just can't cope with it. He can't live like that. So he suspends time. He goes back in. He buys the horse for Albert so that um, whoever it was you saw go in the shop at the beginning of the movie, the tall man buying the horse for some other child, turned out not to be true. Death overturns it all. He can't bear for this little child to be disappointed, and so he, he buys Albert the horse. And in this way, though it's a faint, faint shadow, any time you can't bear somebody else's disappointment, or worse, your own, you are really reflecting, refracting uh, God who couldn't bear his own disappointment that we destroyed the world he had made. So he immediately set about to make a better one, one that couldn't be destroyed and broken. And having made Abraham and the whole Old Testament wait such a long time, the writer of Hebrews looks out at the crowd, whoever's reading it, um, and says to the church, that's you, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable uh, number of angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus. When the moment was right, God solved our greatest problem by sending Jesus as an infant who grew into a man who walked straight into that crowded, divided city to die and rise again. And in that astonishing reversal of our fortunes, at that moment, he founded the country. 
He built the walls. He began taking you as living stones and putting them into the building. He began sorting out the room so that everyone could actually be together in one place with Abraham and Isaiah and you and Jesus. The thing that you so desperately want is that. We confuse it with wooden horses and Hallmark and people being good, uh, with golden Christmases. Um, but even if you have all that other stuff, your heart yearns for really for Jesus, for the great city. You can't see him, but he sees you. And he's not satisfied until you're satisfied. So you can wait a little longer if you like. Um, you can have a meltdown this Christmas if you'd like with me. Um, but better to remember and prize that you are members in corporate of the mystical body of Jesus who did everything for you. Thank you.